two more minutes on Facebook Live. We'll get there. Don't worry. Hi, everybody, and welcome to the Yvonne Brooks Show. Uh, I'm excited to be with you again this week, and I see a lot of people are joining us. That's a good sign, uh, particularly after the crazy week uh, I've at least had uh, after the last show. We'll get to that in a minute. Let me, uh, let me also say hello to everybody on uh, Facebook Live. So, oh, the camera's over there. I, I keep looking at my iPad where the, um, the image is being projected, and I, I'm waving at the wrong place. Anyway... Uh, we're on Facebook Live, and so let me start by apologizing to those on Facebook Live regarding a few things. One, um, I haven't really designed this space to be on video, so what you're really seeing is a uh, bedroom that used to be my son's that I kind of converted into a temporary studio. It's not very aesthetic looking, uh, not like the rest of my house. My house, uh, the rest of the house is very aesthetic looking with sculptures and paintings and artwork everywhere, plastered on the walls and on everywhere. So I apologize for the background. You know, over time, in the months to come, if I have time, uh, I'll try to make your background more appealing and more uh, more interesting. Uh, we, we will see what I can do. I, I, I'm going to build out this studio and create create something here that's, uh, that's more workable. Let me also apologize. Uh, you know, I'm really focused about talking, a lot focused on how I look. I, I, I'm not dressing up for this stuff. Um, and uh, finally, I get hungry in the middle of these radio shows. And uh, the people on radio don't know this, but I usually take a commercial break in order to eat something. And the people on Facebook Live are going to look at it, unless I kind of cover up the camera like this while I eat. So uh, uh, I apologize for that as well. Well, I don't really apologize for it. Just, you know, suck it up. Um, and then uh, one more thing. What was the other? Oh, yes. Finally, I still have not figured out, and I don't know if I will figure out anytime soon, how to get uh, onto Facebook Live the audio of any phone calls that come in and the audio of the commercials and the music as it happens. So for now, you're just going to have to wait patiently. I'll try to repeat the questions so that uh, on Facebook Live you know what I'm responding to. Uh, but yeah, it's it's just not the same experience on Facebook Live. You don't get uh, you don't get it all. The, the other problem with the technology, as I have it right now, is that there's a bit of a lag between the video and the audio. Uh, so if you're listening to Facebook Live and watching the video, there's going to be a lag between the two. And I think if I connect the video, if I connect the audio into the computer and uh, ultimately get you the audio from blog talk radio rather than from the microphone on the camera i think there's going to be a whole syncing problem so until facebook live and my technology get finally completely synced up we're going to have these problems a, a good discussion to have on a day where we're going to be talking about silicon valley all right uh now we'll talk about silicon valley but there are a few things that i need to talk about uh, first, before I get to that, and uh, right now, I've got a little problem with the chat here. I have to relaunch it, unfortunately. Um, but um, a, a few issues, I just want to clean up some misunderstanding, misconceptions, just some stuff. Um, I assume most of you know that the last week has been pretty intense in terms of the, the responses, both to the radio show to Ankar Gatte's piece on, um, that we've published at the Ayn Institute on uh, the Trump election, uh, responses to my shows on the alt-right, 
uh, there's been a lot of backlash. There are a lot of people out there, a lot of people who identify with objectivism or who are Ayn Rand fans who fundamentally disagree with me and with Ankar and with the, with the Institute on this issue. And uh, uh, it, it's creating a huge uh, disagreement within the objectivist world, which is interesting, interesting. We'll have to talk about this more in the future, but all kinds of stuff is out there. So, so I want to so I want to clarify a few things quickly, uh, and then I want to talk about uh, Trump's appointments from this week, and then we'll get to Silicon Valley. So just be patient; uh, we will get to the discussion of Silicon Valley. But I think this stuff is interesting and relevant to a lot of our discussion. And I'm going to try not to move my chair too much because I have a feeling it's distracting on the video. And let me let me change the there we go. All right, the first is um, you know a few weeks ago I did a show on the alt right. I, I strongly recommend everybody listen to that show. I think it's an important show. I think understanding the old right and being vigilant against it is really, really, really important uh, because I think that the old right, even though I don't like the name and I don't like the ambiguity around what the alt right is, uh, the alt right is a very, very dangerous, sneaky uh, phenomena that uh, that is really endangering this country. And I think we need to be particularly vigilant because. And this is why, because many people are going to try to lump objectivism into the alt-right. Many people are going to look at objectivism as part of the alt-right. And it's a problem with the name, alternative right. In some regards, objectivism is an alternative right, although I would like to say objectivism is just alt. Objectivism is just an alternative. It's not, uh, it's not right. It's not left. It's the ultimate alternative to the statism of both right and left, particularly both left and alt-right, or alt-left and alt-right, and all the everything in between. Subjectivism is completely different. Um, so let me tell you what I think alt-right is, uh, what I consider the alt-right, and, uh, and uh, of course there are a lot of people at the periphery of this that accept some of these ideas, reject other of these ideas, but the importance is that you should never be associated with Never be associated with anybody who self-identifies as alt-right or anybody who self-identified as any of the characteristics of alt-right. And here are the characteristics. The characteristics are nationalism. And what do I mean by nationalism? Nationalism means the placing of the well-being of the state above the well-being of the individual. The state above the individual. That is essentially what nationalism is. It's a form of collectivism. This is not nationalism with a small n uh, which kind of refers to love of your country because it's a good country, kind of somewhat similar to patriotism. No, this is nationalism with a big N placing the nation above the individual. Um, Anti-immigration is, is part of the alt-right's agenda. Uh, racist elements, all kind of racist elements, some of them hidden, some of them explicit, but alt-right ultimately is a collectivistic and often racist uh, uh, ideas. I won't even call it a, 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 a ideology because that's a, that's a little strong. Economic nationalism in a sense of trade protection. Thinking about the economy not from the perspective of individual rights. Thinking about the economy not from the perspective of whether it's good for any particular individual, but thinking about the economy from the perspective of society, the state, the nation. So economic nationalism, which is, by the way, one of the ways Bannon self-describes himself. He self-describes himself as an economic nationalist. I'm not making this up. This is, this is directly in, his, uh, in interviews with him. Um, uh, one of the examples of this, which we've dis discussed on the show before, focus kind of on IQ of collective groups. Uh, and this is, again, anything that's supportive of collectivism, uh, anti-Semitism is often associated with the alt-right. So... I would say objectivism should never, ever be associated with capital and nationalism, never associated with a, a broad anti-immigration perspective, never should be associated with racism, never associated with economic nationalism, never associated with anti-Semitism, never associated with any form of collectivism based on pseudoscience or just an emotionalism. Pseudoscience is emotionalism. All of that. All of them um, uh, are, are not anything to do with uh, with objectivism. Now, 
if you want, uh, if you want references, uh, you know, I don't have, I'm not doing a show on alt-right, so I don't have all the references. And the alt-right was not a creation uh, of the uh, progressive left, of the ju social justice warriors. It was a response to the progressive left and, and uh, social justice warriors. But the alt-right is a creation of nationalist racists. Uh, uh, the, the term uh, uh, alternative right, as far as I can tell, was coined by people like Robert Spencer. Robert Spencer is a racist. Just go to his websites. He constantly talks in racist terminology. He's, a, he's an ultimate, ultimate nationalist, racist, white, white separatist. Um, Taki Magazine, which is a big, Takis Magazine, which is a big alternative right magazine, 2009, was talking about the alternative right and alternative right. And they are all racists. All of them racist. Now, that doesn't mean everybody who belongs to alt-right is a racist. Some of them kind of skirt around the racist issue and try to avoid the label. But they're all, in one form or another, collectivists uh, and nationalists and therefore should be condemned. Uh, Milo, who I think is very sympathetic to the alt-right, has a good description of the alt-right alt -right in a, in a uh, I think, Breitbart magazine, Breitbart online, Breitbart.com story. I think he's way too sympathetic to these elements within the alt-right, but, uh, but I think he, he describes some of it fairly accurately. So, um, you know, it's there. Now, again, Milo describes it from a sympathetic perspective. So uh, let's be clear. The alt-right is a movement, as a collection of individuals. doesn't mean every individual within it, but anybody who sympathizes significantly with the alt-right, nationalism, racism, anti-Semitism, and fundamentally collectivism. Fundamentally collectivism. Um, you know, the, the, it, it comes, it, it has a, origins in all kinds of intellectual sources, among others, Pat Buchanan and the paleoconservatives, uh, who had these elements way, way back. But it's really coalesced around a, a group of people who self-identify. I didn't make up the term. The left didn't make up the term. These people made up the term. And people self-identify as part of this movement. They self-identify as it. This is not a creation of the left. This is not a creation of the left. This is a creation of uh, alt-right. Now, should you call them alt-right? Fine. Don't call them alt-right. Call them white supremacists. Call them nationalists. Call them racists. Call them neo-Nazis. Call them what you want to call them. Uh, they self-identify as alt-right. So when you read about them, when you see them all over the place, that's what it's called. I have come to the conclusion, because of the perversion of terms like right and left, the complete distortion, the fact that there's very little difference today between the radical right and the radical left, that we should not describe ourselves as right. We should get away from the idea that right somehow is good, that left somehow uh, is bad, uh, and, uh, and so on. Uh, all right, uh, again... My alt-right show from a few weeks ago, go listen to that, full of concretes, full of examples, full of quotes from people like Robert Spencer to illustrate all this. I just want to make clear that, the, that the, this is a real phenomenon. This is not something that people have made up. Uh, you, can, you can read about it. You can search about it. Uh, it terms like, you know, they, they use terms like race realists. That's racism, human biodiversity that's just another term for racism. They realize that racism is an unpopular term. So they come up with all this other collectivistic garbage and, and evil uh, ideas in order to, to disguise what they're really about. So, uh, you know, I, I want to be really clear about my position. I think you all know my position, but I want to be really, really clear about my position of these people and, um, and, and what they represent. And uh, again, go look up Robert Spencer's articles. He's very clear on his racism. Uh, it, 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 it's, not, it's not hidden. And I'm not going to get into the IQ debate. Uh, I, will, I, will, I do intend to invite on the show uh, sometime in the future a, a psychologist and a statistician uh, to talk about the validity of these stupid uh, IQ uh, studies and IQ, uh, IQ descriptions. Because, again, this is pseudoscience, just like the Nazis did in the name of of uh, racism, and, and this is just, a, 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 again, a pseudoscientific excuse and veneer 
uh, to uh, to disguise the true nature of what uh, of what you guys, some of you guys on the chat, are actually advocating for. So uh, this this is what it is. So I wanted to cover that quickly. Um, what else did I want to cover? I wanted to cover one other thing. Um, yeah, one other thing that came out this week. So there's a lot of people out there talking about the fact that hey. You know, this is the problem with uh, Ayn Rand Institute intellectuals. They're detached. Yuan lives in a gated community. Uh, he, he, he doesn't actually engage with anybody in the world, or he only speaks to students. So uh, all he sees are, are, are left to students. He doesn't feel the pain of the average American because he has no clue what an average American is like because he never interacts with them, right? I'm, I'm, I'm an elitist. I'm an elitist. So first... I am an elitist uh, and proud of it. Uh, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm an intellectual and uh, I, I'm fairly, I'm probably in the 1% would be my guess. I'm in the 1%. I'm in the 1% because I've worked hard. I'm in the 1% because I get paid well by the Institute. But more importantly, I'm in the 1%. Really, I'm in the 1% because I, I, I founded a hedge fund a long time ago and uh, I get some good income from that. I'm not in the 0.1% where I'd like to be, but I'm in the 1%. I'm, I'm proud of the fact that I've made a lot of money. Again, not a lot of money, but I've made some money that I live in a nice house. I live in a nice neighborhood. I live in a gated community. I live in one of the safest places on the planet. Uh, yeah, I've achieved stuff. Good for me. I'm actually pretty proud of all of that. Uh, the fact that I, that I am an intellectual, the fact that I write books, the fact that I engage in ideas, the fact that I've studied, the fact that I've invested a lot in my own ability to do all these things, I'm pretty proud of that. I'm not going to apologize for all of that. I'm part of an intellectual elite. I'm part of an intel of a financial elite, if you will. Um, but, you know, isn't that what you're supposed to be in America? Aren't you supposed to be successful? Aren't you supposed to strive for the better? Now, it happens that I disagree with 99% of the rest of the elite in which I belong. I disagree with most people who have money, and I disagree with most people who are intellectuals. So what, right? So what? Um, but so all of that is true, but detached only speak to students. Are you guys nuts? I, I spend over half my time on the road. I'm the one who gets yelled off the stage by both leftists and Trump supporters. Um, I used to speak. I used to I did more. Um, Tea Party talks than almost any other intellectual I know out there. I hung out with the Tea Party. I was considered the Tea Party celebrity for a while among the, some people in the Tea Party. The only real, the, the only big issue I used to have with the Tea Party in those days was uh, was over religion. Um, those tea, that Tea Party has much evolved into Trump supporters. The idea that I don't know who Trump supporters are, what they are, what they're going through is is complete and utter. Uh, nonsense. I mean, it's it's the it, it, this is exactly at hominem. You don't like what I'm saying. You don't like my point of view. So you attack me personally as I don't know detached. Uh, it's just it's just stupid. But if you know anything about uh, what I actually do, and uh, I'm just checking to see if uh, Facebook is all fine. Um, who I actually engage in? Uh, you have, uh, uh, you have, uh, you know, uh, complete, <laughs> you guys are, are just ignorant. That's a, yeah, I mean, those of you are claiming this and, and actually you're the one, you know, you detached from what's really going on in the world. Uh, let me just say, cause there's a, there's a discussion going on in the chat over, over the alt-right. Just stop it. You know, just stop it. Go watch the original, go watch, go listen to the original show on the alt-right and actually read a whole article, as I did, by uh, Robert Spencer, and listen to him on NPR, and, and and then anybody who's rational, anybody who is uh, who, who is not already a racist, will identify Robert Spencer as an out and out racist, right? And 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 uh, and you know, not quotes out of context. Read whole articles; it's disgusting. It's it's horrific, uh, you know. This is the kind of stuff that I want to make sure, and this is why I'm making a big deal out of it. 
and why I'm making a big deal out of Trump. So let me get to that as well. The reason I'm making a big deal out of the alt-right and a big deal out of Trump is I want to make clear. Sorry, it was, uh, I think it's wrong. But anyway, I want to make clear, I unequivocally, that objectivism has nothing to do with the points of view of the alt-right. And that objectivism has nothing to do with the opinions articulated by Donald Trump. That there's nothing about Trump that is remotely like Ayn Rand's heroes, that is remotely, uh, you know, consistent with objectivism. He might be a fan of the Fountainhead. He might be a businessman. But I don't want people out there, particularly young people, and we'll get to Silicon Valley in a minute. I don't want young people to be confused by objectivism and the alt-right, by objectivism and Donald Trump. It, there's nothing similar between the two. And this is why I'm making a big deal out of this. This is why I spend more time right now criticizing uh, these rightist ideas of Donald Trump and, if you want to call them right, these collectivistic, these, um, uh, these statist ideas of Donald Trump and the alt-right. This is why I spend so much time on them and less on the left because nobody confuses objectivism with the left. But people clearly confuse it with objectivism, these ideas with objectives. And my job, a big part of my job, is to clearly defend what objectivism is, to be vigilant about defending Ayn Rand's philosophy against those who would confuse it with something that it's not. And, and this is why it's important to differentiate between objectivism and libertarianism. And it's important to differentiate between objectivism and alt-right, between objectivism and Trump. And I also want to make sure that objectivists or those who sympathize with objectivism, the people, uh, people who are fans of Ayn Rand, stay vigilant, stay vigilant, stay vigilant against the alt-right, monitoring them, making sure, again, these confusions don't exist, but also stay vigilant about Donald Trump. So don't just because he's not a leftist doesn't mean we should not really watch what he does, be critical of what he does. Uh, we are radicals. We are radicals. Uh, we are not conservatives. We are not even libertarians. We are certainly not on the right or on the left. We're not Trumpist statists, any kind of statist. We're not nationalists. We're not economic nationalists. We are individualists. We're something the world doesn't recognize and, and, and the alt-right certainly has no clue about, doesn't even, doesn't even know what to do with an idea like individualism. So, I, I, you know, we're not any of these things. And it's so important, so important, as people get really excited about Donald Trump and these debates get heated up, that at the end of the day, we identify what is objectivism and what's your personal point of view. Objectivism has nothing to do with Trumpism. It has nothing to do with alt-right. It has nothing to do with the right as it exists today. Right? Capitalism. It's important we understand what capitalism is. So, um, and, and, there's a debate going on with, within the objectivist movement, the broad movement, about Donald Trump. And there are people who kind of like Donald Trump. I think they're wrong. And I think, I think it reflects very badly on the movement, that the movement, to the extent that the movement becomes supportive of Donald Trump. Again, you could have voted for him because the alternative was Hillary Clinton. I'm not condemning people who voted for Donald Trump. But to support Donald Trump is not the same as to have voted for him. Uh, I, I think it's a huge mistake to be a Donald Trump supporter. Uh, I, I think it's inconsistent. Remember, Ayn Rand would not support Ronald Reagan. Ayn Rand would not vote for Ronald Reagan. Now, Ayn Rand's uh, about as... Uh, <laughs> Ayn Rand is objectivism. Ayn Rand was objectivism, right? And, and Ronald Reagan is a million, I mean, 
I probably would have voted for Ronald Reagan. I probably would vote for Ronald Reagan today. So I, I, I am much more sympathetic to Ronald Reagan than I am much more to, uh, to Donald Trump. And remember, Ayn Rand didn't vote for Reagan. There's no way in hell she would have voted for, for Donald Trump. All right. Um, so one of the reasons I'm so critical of Trump is we need to be vigilant. I don't want anybody to confuse Trump with a capitalist. I don't want anybody to confuse Trump with an Ayn Rand hero. I don't want anybody to confuse Trump with an objectivist. I don't want, I don't want objectivism associated with the policies of this administration. And it's up to us, all of us, all of us. It's up to us to make clear what objectivism is, how radical it truly is, what it represents, what its true views are, on many of these issues, because the media won't do it for us, uh, the people in, in political power won't do it for us, the, the rest of the elites don't do it for us. If we don't do it, nobody will do it. So uh, I encourage you, in terms of what one can do, is make sure to differentiate, make sure to be clear in what ways we are different than the status quo. Status quo of the left, status quo of the right, status quo of all the different alternatives to left and right, all the different stuff that is going on out there. So just, just uh, we, we need, we need, uh, we need vigilance. That's what we need. I don't know. Let me just play around here a second with Facebook Live because for some reason I don't think it's doing what it's supposed to do. Um, all right, all right. Hopefully, hopefully it'll work in a second. Uh, let's go there. All right, so um, let's see, Just one more second. Ah, forget it. No, wait, I'm stopping to play. Okay, let's, uh, wow, we've got a bunch of phone calls. So again, I apologize to those of you on, the fo on uh, Facebook Live, you're not going to hear the phones. Um, because of that, I'd appreciate if on the phone you'd, you'd make it short. Um, so that uh, we, we don't have too much dead time on Facebook Live. And I'm going to try to get through these questions because I've got two big topics I still need to cover uh, and uh, haven't covered yet. Hi, you're on the Yvonne Book Show. Who's this? Hey, Dustin, I'm doing well. How about you? That's right. That's right. Okay, so uh, the re so Dustin's asking why I'm not a supporter of, of Donald Trump supporters. I'm not going to repeat my show from last week. So I encourage you to listen to my show from last week. You can get it on, on any podcast app. Uh, just look your own book show and, and, and listen to it because I spent an hour and a half explaining in great detail why I'm not a Donald Trump supporter and why I, I think it's a mistake to support him. I also would encourage you to go and, um, uh, and uh, read Ankar Gatte's essay on Donald Trump, so, uh, which, which is available on the Ayn Rand, on the Ayn Rand web website. So sorry, Dustin, I don't want to repeat everything I said last week. Most of the people listened, listened last week. All right? I get that, but I'm not going to repeat everything I said last week. So, so please go back, listen to last week's show, and then call in next week with questions if, if you disagree with anything I said. Thanks for calling, Dustin. All right, we've got another caller on 416 area code. Hi, you're on the Iran Book Show. Hi, Elizabeth from Ottawa. How's it going? I'm good, I'm good. What's up? Yeah, no, I, I, to some extent. So, uh, so uh, uh, this is a question about all the people in the chat in uh, that are, that are alt right. 
I mean, the real alt-right people, I would, I would love to find a way to kind of exclude them from the chat. If I could figure out the technology, I might actually do that because I, I think you're right. I, I find it particularly disgusting. But what I, unfortunately, what I'm finding is that there are a lot of people, and I think basically good people, who are being seduced by this. And the reason I'm responding and the reason I'm talking about it is to try to prevent young people, I think relatively innocent people, from doing being seduced by this uh, this horrible stuff that the alt-right is preaching. Um, so at some point, I will get rid of them from the chat. I'll figure out how to do that. Um, I also said, uh, you know, participating in the chat is not that crucial. So hopefully, and, I, and I, I'm not, not going not gonna to spend a lot of these radio shows on the alt-right because I find it disgusting and despicable, and I've done my thing. And anybody who wants to listen, just like if you want to listen to what I think about Donald Trump, listen to last week's show. If you really want to listen, hear what I have to say about the alt-right, listen to the show from earlier, um, it, from about a month ago. Uh, I'm not going to keep repeating it, but uh, I, I, had to, I had to clarify a few things before I went on. So, I, you know, I understand why you're so offended. <laughs> I don't know if that makes you feel any better. <laughs> No, I don't believe in toleration. I'm completely intolerant to this point of view. This is a barbaric, evil, offensive, horrible, uh, illegitimate uh, set of ideas. If, if, sure, you have a right to free speech. Go and spout it anyway. This is my platform. If, if you're going to spout uh, those ideas on my platform, I have every right to exclude you, exclude you, and I will at some point. And those of you on the chat right now, if you want to voluntarily disappear, that'll make me happy. Okay? <laughs> sure. Thanks. Thanks for calling. Thanks for listening. All right. Uh, we're gonna take um, we're gonna take two more quick calls, and then I am I'm actually uh, okay. We'll see what I'm gonna do then. Uh, but hi, you're on the Iran book show. Who's this? This is three zero two eight eight code. Who's this? Hey, Skylar from Delaware. How's it going? Good, good, good. Good, so, yeah, go ahead. Okay, so I have promised to devote a portion of the show to the article, You Can Love Ayn Rand and uh, God and Ayn Rand, and I will, I promise, it just won't be today. Um, Ankar Gatte has a letter in response in the Wall Street Journal. Now, it's very short because it's a letter. I will respond to that article. I think that's, I'll just say very quickly, I think the article is ridiculous. I think it's, it shows a complete contempt for philosophy, certainly a complete contempt for the objectivist philosophy, and I will respond to it because so, uh, in, in a future show. Because certainly you can love Ayn Rand and God, but you can't, you have to understand what that means, and you have to understand that what you're rejecting is Ayn Rand's philosophy, even though you love the books. But that requires a whole show, Skyla, and I need to get on with what I have planned for today. Thanks for calling. All right, let show my pleasure. Uh, all right, whoops, why won't say, there he goes. Um, last call for now. You can call again later, but last call for now. Hi, the 808 area code. Uh, you're on your own book show. Who's this? Hey, Stuart, don't bring me back to the alt right, please. <laughs> But let me get a Silicon Valley, and then maybe I take your call after that. How about that? Okay, go for it. Quickly, though. I, I, I'm going to... I'm going to talk about that. I'm going to talk about it. I promise. I'll talk about it. It's in my list. <laughs> okay? All right. Thanks, Stuart. <laughs> I'll be all right. So let's. Uh, so so this is the deal. This is the deal I'm going to make. I, I'm not going to talk about uh, Trump's appointments right now. Um, I'm going to make the AM 560 show all about Trump's appointments. So on that show, I'm going to talk about uh, Reese Priebus. I'm going to talk about Bannon. I'm going to talk about Sessions. I'm going to talk about Flynn. I'm going to talk about Pompeo uh, on the 560 show. I'm going to actually try to broadcast the 560 show 
on Facebook Live, so you can watch it there. You can also uh, listen to it when it becomes, you can listen to it, um, there's a way to listen to it if you if you go to the AM560 website, uh, and you can also listen to the AM560 show, it'll be a podcast that'll be uploaded on Monday or Tuesday. So you can listen to my analysis, and I will talk more about Bannon's comment about Asian CEOs there, although I'll probably get to it in my discussion about Silicon Valley as well. Um, but uh, but I'm gonna do I'm gonna do the uh, yeah I'm gonna do the Trump appointments uh, on the AM560 show again. You can listen to it live uh, online. You can also listen to it afterwards when I when it's uploaded as a podcast in uh, in a few days. And uh, I will try. I, no, I will. Although there there were long commercial breaks, but I will. Uh, do a Facebook Live of the M560 show just to see how it works uh, with the uh, with the live commercials and and whether that's something that's doable. So we'll try, uh, we'll try. All right, uh, let's see. Here we go. I want to talk about. I really want to talk about Silicon Valley because for two reasons. Two reasons I want to talk about Silicon Valley. One is I'm really really depressed and and I need an upper, right? I mean all this discussion about. Uh, about Trump, the alt-right, uh, trade, uh, immigration, uh, all of this stuff is just, it, I find it just depressing. Now, some of the Silicon Valley stuff I'm going to talk about is also going to be depressing. But I want to talk about something uplifting. And I consider, I, I, and this is a controversial, and, and this is the other thing. I've seen this on Twitter and on Facebook. I've been criticized for loving Silicon Valley too much. How can you love Silicon Valley when Silicon Valley is so leftist? So I wanna, I wanna talk about something positive. I consider Silicon Valley unbelievably positive. I consider Silicon Valley maybe the most positive thing going on in the culture in which we live. Um, and I, I, I wanna do, I wanna do at least a portion of the show, if not most of the show, on something inspiring and something uplifting. So um, uh, I wanna focus on Silicon Valley. Uh, and I'm going to try to really ignore the chat because it's going all over the place. It's going, it's it's discussing what I discussed 10 minutes ago, and, and, and I really want to move forward. I really move on. Huh. Um, and as part of the Silicon Valley discussion, we're going to talk about, about things like immigration and trade because I think you have to. But I want to talk about what Silicon Valley represents. Why do I consider Silicon Valley the real America? When I think so many people want to think of the real America as um, the Rust Belt, the Tea Party. To me, Silicon Valley is what America really represents. And indeed, I think the Rust Belt used to be Silicon Valley. Indeed, if you, if you read a little bit of history, if you read, particularly if you read um, the history of kind of uh, capitalism in America, you will find that a place like Michigan, Michigan used to be the Silicon Valley of America. But today, Silicon Valley is Silicon Valley. Now, there are outposts of Silicon Valley all over the country, in places like Austin, in places like Boston, in places like Colorado, in Boulder, and in Denver, um, and all over. Because Silicon Valley, what does Silicon Valley represent? Silicon Valley represents business. It represents business, which Ayn Rand has characterized as the essential characteristic of America. America is the land of business, of wealth creation, of entrepreneurship, of going out there and having a vision and translating science into technology, science into values that lift the standard of living that everybody who trades with you. So business is the essential fundamental characteristic of America. And when you look at business that has not been corrupted by cronyism, business that has not that has been left relatively free to innovate and produce and create and move forward, then Silicon Valley is where business today is thriving. Silicon Valley is where the entrepreneur is still venerated and is thriving. Silicon Valley as what it represents, the, the whole technology world that, again, includes Seattle. I, did, I forgot Seattle, but obviously for Seattle, where Amazon and Microsoft and, and Salesforce and many other companies are based. 
But that attitude, that attitude of can we can do it, we can create, we can build, we can innovate, we can produce. That attitude that builds and creates and sustains businesses. That is what that is what Silicon Valley uh, really is. That is what is the essential characteristic of Silicon Valley, and that's uh, and and that's why I think it represents it represents America. It represents that can do, you know, create a mentality, a driven mentality. I can produce. I can create. I can invent. I can make. There are no boundaries. Now, let me just say that I recommend a, a short talk by Jason Crawford that you can find on um, on iTunes, not on iTunes, on YouTube. I always get those two mixed up. Uh, the spirit of Atlas Shrugged is alive in Silicon Valley, and I agree with pretty much everything Jason says in that video. So I, I, I encourage people uh, to uh, to go find the video and watch it. Uh, I'll, so, uh, you know, some of the stuff I say, I'm in a sense taking from Jason, although you know, we very much agree on this, uh, but he, he's got some nice ways in which he's phrasing this, so, uh, so, so, so I, 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 like, I like what he does with it. But uh, Silicon Valley as an industry, as a mindset, as an attitude, as a focus, reflects what America really is, and more than that, more than that, much more than Trump, and much more than... The, the crony businessmen that are out there and much more than any politician, in spite of disagreeing with her politics, Silicon, Repre Silicon Valley represents Ayn Rand's worldview, represents what is essential about Ayn Rand's worldview. So let's, let's, take, let's take Ayn Rand's ethics, the ethics of self-interest, the ethics of rational egoism, and what does Ayn Rand identify as the core, fundamental, cardinal moral values of the objectivist philosophy? What, is, what are the core, fundamental values of Ayn Rand's moral philosophy? Reason, purpose, self-esteem. Now, I can't think, I can't think of another industry right now in America today, of another geographic location that represents reason, purpose, and self-esteem more than Silicon Valley. Right? I mean, Silicon Valley is about science. It's about, oops, um, it's about science, it's about technology, it's about the application of science, it about, it's about using the human mind, it's about innovation. Every other, every other industry has been constrained, limited, force has been used against it by government as, an, as a consequence, innovation has been crushed. And you don't see the expression of reason and rationality as a consequence. So if you are growing up as a thinker, and if you want to be able to think new ideas and implement those ideas and apply your reason to your career, Silicon Valley is the best place to go do it. It's hard to do anywhere else because of government intervention. But the fact is that today, I mean, reason as a faculty that identifies and integrates the material provided by man's senses, right? That's what these guys do. They identify the facts of reality out there, they integrate, and they find solutions. They find, they discover new technologies. They apply themselves. To making the world a better place. So, they are the epitome of what it means to use reason to make the world a better place, at least from a material perspective, right? 
to change the world from a material perspective. Who's changed the world more than the entrepreneurs and the companies and the businesses of Silicon Valley? Uh, and, and, and it's, you know, the, the places that represent Silicon Valley. Nobody else. No other industry. No politician represents reason in the same sense as the entrepreneurs as applied to their businesses. Apply reason to the management of their businesses, to the discovery of new products, to the launching of new products, to the whole way in which they do business. Purpose. These people have a purpose. They are single-mindedly pursuing, pursuing their goals. They live their careers. Everything you read in Ayn Rand about career, about purpose, about productiveness, is epitomized by the, the entrepreneurs and the founders and the engineers and the CEOs of Silicon Valley. You might disagree with all their politics. You know, some of them have even called for secession from the United States because of Trump's election. But if you look at their business life, if you look at what they actually do, if you look at how they actually behave, how they live their life, wow! I mean, you should all go listen to... Um, Steve Jobs' commencement address at Stanford, uh, the, the, the speech is available on, on YouTube, and it's a fantastic address. It talks about living. It talks about pursuing your passion. It talks about making your life the best life that it can be. Yeah, Steve Jobs is an Iron Man hero, undoubtedly. He is a man who applied his reason, who took his career seriously, had immense self-esteem. And went out and built something, created something. He didn't sit and whine and complain. And I want to get to the whining and complaining in a minute. These are people with purpose and self-esteem. Now, did he screw up in his personal life? Sure he did. You remember Reardon? Reardon screws up in his personal life. Three quarters of Atlas Shrugged, Reardon is screwing up his personal life. Does that make him less of a hero of Ayn Rand? Does that make less... A weirder, less of a giant? I mean, you could easily, easily see Steve Jobs as a Hank Reardon. Yes, he messed up he, he, in his diet, right? In his, in his uh, appeal of certain mysticism. So did Hank Reardon. In his the appeal of altruism, the commitment to family, his bogus relationship with his wife, right? But they are giants of production. They are giants of reason. They are giants of self-esteem. They are giants of purpose. Steve Jobs had immense self-esteem. This world was his world. When you saw him walk on that stage, this world was his. He lived in it. He deserved to live in it. And he knew he deserved to live in it. He belonged in this world. And he could manage this world. He knew how to manipulate nature for his own well-being. He's a magnificent example of a real-life hero. Reason, purpose, self-esteem. In his business life, these are what Steve Jobs exemplified. And what so many, I would say almost all, the leaders and entrepreneurs and, and founders and engineers and the workers in Silicon Valley, this is what they exemplify. This is what they exemplify. Now, if you look at the virtues, if you look at the objectivist virtues, rationality, productiveness, independence, justice, pride, I can't think of a group of people on the planet, as a, you know, where, where you can pick individuals within the group randomly, who more exemplify these virtues than the people living and working and producing and creating in Silicon Valley and, again, all the related aspects of it. They are extraordinarily rational when it comes to their business life. Again, they're compartmentalized. I get that. Their politics suck. And maybe some of their personal choices suck. 
But wow, the way they continuously innovate. Think about independence. Think about independence. Think about the founder of Uber challenging the regulated world out there, challenging an entrenched industry that has government and special interests and lawyers and everything protecting your taxis. And he shatters that world. And he, he comes up with an idea nobody else has. And I bet you he gets rejected by, by a bunch of different venture capitalists before he can raise his money, like most startups in Silicon Valley who get rejected regularly. But ultimately, succeed. Ultimately, thrive. So, this is exactly what they do, right? They think independently. This is the, the primary characteristic of an entrepreneur. Thinking and being independent. Who better exemplifies that again than, than uh, Bill Gates? Steve Jobs, uh, even people like Larry Ellison, uh, uh, the guy who founded Uber, the guy who founded Airbnb, and, and look at uh, Mark Zuckerberg. I mean, think about Mark Zuckerberg. Think about what he's built and what he's created. Right? He's built a, a place where literally hundreds of millions of people spend time, enjoy, connect with one another. It's astounding. It's astounding. It should be celebrated. It should put a smile on your face. Travis Kalanick is the Uber guy. Sorry, I, I forget names. And, and, and Kalanick is not a name that's going to stick with me. It's very hard to very hard to sustain. Yeah, very hard to hold for me. Um. Anyway, it's a beautiful, beautiful place. I, I lived in Silicon Valley from '93 to 2000, and the excitement. The energy, the fact that you could drive around at 2 or 3 in the morning and you could see the lights on in places where people were working. Right? Wow. I mean, that's just thrilling. It's, you know, it's that culture that is, that, is, uh, that is producing the kind of products that are making our lives so much better. That so many of you who are pessimistic who, who, who think the world is coming to an end, want to ignore, want to pretend don't exist. Google, think about Google. There's a company for you. I mean, what would life be without Google? It's stunning, the, the benefit uh, that Google has provided all of our lives for free, for free. They created a business model based on giving away free products, right? And of course, before Google, there was Yahoo, and there were others, and they competed. But think, think about what they've created. Independence, reflection of independence and rationality, and of course, productiveness. Again, career, focus. Justice. One of the things about Silicon Valley is to the extent to which it's a meritocracy, to the extent to which you get compensated based on how much you create, the value you produce. <clears throat> Justice. People are not, uh, 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 you know, on the downside. People are not, if you fail, it's not like, ah, you're a loser. No, right? Failure is an opportunity to learn. And the fact that you fail is not necessarily going to stop somebody from funding your success in the future. The whole model is based on application of reason to judging people and judging ideas. Justice. Where would you, where do you find a more just environment than Silicon Valley? Again, as it applies to work, as it applies to production. And pride. We talked a little bit about this in self-esteem. I mean, people in Silicon Valley are proud of their achievement, as they should be. And it's fabulous. You know, they, they know they've changed the world. And they respect themselves for having changed the world. So, Silicon Valley and the people in Silicon Valley, the individuals in Silicon Valley, are, in my view, the best manifestation we have today 
Not to say you couldn't have anything better. Of Ayn Rand's universe, of Colorado in Atlas Shrugged, of the spirit of Atlas Shrugged, and of the moral values and virtues that Ayn Rand taught us, of Ayn Rand's ethics. <clears throat> Again, as applied in this one realm, one realm, granted, these people are compartmentalized like most people are, and I wish they weren't. But remember, so is, so is Reardon, and so to a large extent was Dagny. Dagny does not agree with John Galt. Dagny fights John Galt. She's still a hero. You don't have to agree with John Galt in order to be a hero. You don't have to be as fully integrated, as fully knowledgeable as John Galt in order to be a hero. And yeah, certainly these people are no, you know, there are very few people who are Dagny. But Reardon, yeah, I, I, I see these people as Reardons. And, and from, from the work ethic, from the work, from the uh, uh, independence at work, from, uh, from, yeah, I mean, a lot of these CEOs in Silicon Valley that I've met over the years certainly are the closest we have today, the closest we have today to, uh, to Ayn Rand heroes like Reardon and Dagny. Okay, um, so that's who they are morally. Now, a lot of people condemn them because of their political positions, and we should. We should attack their political positions. But morality is much more fundamental than politics. Morality is much more fundamental than politics. Now, we're all going to be affected negatively, you would say, from their political positions, to the extent that they have political say. True. True. But you know what? Think about the positives. Think about how wonderful our life is because these people are moral when it comes to their work, because they exemplify these moral values. Think of how our lives are so much better. Now, there's a lot of people out there, a lot of Trump supporters, objectivists and not objectivists who say, oh... Nothing's happened in the last 50 years from an economic perspective. The last 30 years have been, you know, nothing has changed. Well, first, read my book with Don Watkins, Equal is Unfair, because we cover this. We really cover this whole idea that the economy has stagnated over the, the, the myth that the economy has stagnated completely over the last 30 years. And then somebody told me, well, you're on. If you believe the economy's advanced over the last 30 years, I saw this on Facebook or Twitter, then you must think that the mixed economy is okay because we've had this horrible mixed economy. So you must be a socialist. You believe in government intervention because the economy's done better. How, how stupid do you have to be, really? Yeah, the economy hasn't gotten better. It's gotten better because Silicon Valley is relatively free. That's right. If the entire economy had been free, we would be gazillions of times better than we are today. So, yes, if you just think about your own life, the kind of products you were using 30 years ago and the kind of products you're using today, the cost of those products 30 years ago and the cost of the products today, the quality of the products 30 years ago and the quality of the products today. By every parameter, when you do those kind of analysis, our lives from a material perspective are so much better today and the reason for that the reason for that is the people in Silicon Valley even our cars are better today primarily because of the technology embedded in them they've Bluetooth and the fact that we can stream music and the fact that we have maps all stuff that Silicon Valley in one way or another has created and commercialized and think about Think about maps. <laughs> Do you remember when you traveled? And I used, I, I've always traveled a lot. So taking out those big maps and trying to figure out where you were and getting lost and asking people and getting directions. Do you remember getting directions from people? Do you remember how god awful getting directions was? Horrific. Now, nobody stops with directions. You got Google Maps, you got Waze. I, my favorite is Waze. You got Apple Maps. You know, there are a lot of Apple Maps jokes, I know. But um, just think about how that, 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 that little one app 
that one simple thing, how that has uh, changed your life. Uh, so Silicon Valley, the land of reason, a land of purpose, a land of people with self-esteem, a land of independent thinking, contrarians. Now, Ayn Rand called them, and, and this is from Jason's talk, lonely and right. And that's exactly what it's like. If, if you've ever been in a startup, it's lonely. And people say no to you and no to you. And no, really smart people tell you you don't know what you're talking about all the time. Right? You, you go in front of venture capitalists and they make fun of you. They say no to you. And yet, you have to stand up and keep going. And you do. Right? A lot of people have turned down many of some of the best ideas coming out of, uh, coming out of Silicon Valley. Driven people who create real value and capture it. And, and, and again, one of the beauties of the Valley is that it's so explicitly win-win. It's so explicitly win-win in terms of the relationship. Whether it's win-win with the customers, whether it's win-win with employees, stock options, the use of the use of stock, the use of the the the, the, the heavy use of compensation through stock to, to, to align incentives to make employees owners. I mean that's that's huge in the valley. Such an act of justice and such an act of the trader principle. Such an illustration, a concrete of the trader principle. Now, long term thinking, think about how long it takes these companies to come about. Now in, in pure technology, some of these things happen pretty quickly. But think about biotech, which is another big industry in Silicon Valley. Think about biotech. You can go 10, 15, 20 years until you see a result. And people are willing to fund you for 10 years. People talk about capitalism being short term. That is so ridiculous. So ridiculous. Capitalism is essentially long term. And biotech is a great example of this. Nothing in biotech is short term. And the advances in biotech have been stunning over the last 20 years. Stunning. And the value created by biotech companies has been stunning over the last 20 years. And the advances I think we're going to have in the next 20 years, if they, if they remain to be allowed to be free, and of course, the, the advances we would have had in biotech, if not for the FDA, that, that'll be, I mean, I mean I'll have, I'll do a show and we'll do a show on, uh, on uh, the FDA and it's, it's crippling and how it cripples innovation, how it cripples our lives. Uh, just, just CRISPR, CRISPR, this, this new gene splicing technology, I mean, I've read a little bit about them and, I'm, and I, I'm not, you know, I'm not, I'm not, I don't fully understand, but just from what I've read, stunning. The ability now uh, to, uh, to splice genes, to do genetic engineering quickly, really, really fast, to do gene editing really, really fast and really, really efficiently. I mean, it blows my mind. I love this stuff. I love this stuff. You know, it, 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 this is what, it, it, if we had a free world, if we had the reason I want freedom, one of the reasons, there are many reasons. One of the main reasons I want freedom is I want more of this kind of stuff. I want to be able to open up the newspaper and see stories about the wonderful new innovations that have come about, the wonderful new science, the wonderful new technology that has been created. And, 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 and that would be the top of the news, right? That would be the exciting things. And that's what you get when you actually follow, when you actually follow uh, uh, Silicon Valley, right? And it, it's, it's awe-inspiring, right? And I know the people on the chat and elsewhere that have been trained to be cynics and can do nothing but complain and bitch. And I, and I want to get to this point because this is a point that pisses me off royally. Um, one of the really bad things I noticed within objectivism, and one of the really bad things I noticed among objectivists in the objectivist community, and I've noticed this for 30 years. I've been an objectivist. I, I read out with shrugged. Oh, my God. Next year, it'll be 40 years ago. 4-0. Um, I've seen a lot of objectivists. I've met a lot of objectivists. I've interacted with a lot of objectivists. And I've only been 
a, a leader in the objectivist movement, if you will, for the last 16, 17 years. So I, you know, I, I just interacted with people. One of the things that always has upset me, uh, and still upsets me, uh, upsets me more now than ever, is people who use objectivism as an excuse for their own failure. People who use objectivism as an excuse to fail and to rationalize their failure, right? You want to criticize Steve Jobs? Go build a company. Go create something. Go make something. Go build something. Make your presence known on this planet, right? Steve Jobs changed the world. Until you are in a category of changing the world, really, really, you want to criticize I know a lot of objectivists who say, oh, I didn't succeed because the world's a statist world. I didn't succeed because... And you know, there's some truth to this. I'm not saying there's no truth to it. And certainly in certain professions, like in art, it's, it's very difficult to succeed in a, in a culture like we have today. In, uh, in academia, it's very difficult. There's certain areas. As an intellectual, it's very difficult to succeed. But if you're in business... And, and you're not in a, any particular business, but you're in business. Stop using, stop using the excuse that the world is not good enough for you to be good in. Find that part of the world where you can be successful. You only live once. You're not being successful for me. You're not being, su being successful for other objectivists. You're not being successful for your parents. You need to be find where you can be successful and be successful in your own life for you. For you. So go make a success of yourself. There are no excuses. I'm sorry. We still live in a mostly free world. We still live in an era. Of, if you look at human history, in one of the freest eras in human history where there are more opportunities other than maybe in the 19th century, more opportunities today than ever before. I don't buy excuses. I'm not saying that this is true of everybody who, who has not been successful. Yeah, there, there are certain circumstances I know where the government has crushed you, where, where, where uh, collectivism and, and the culture have made it impossible for you to be successful. But that's rare, very, very rare. Most of the people I know, most of the people I know who are objectivist and bitterly, constantly, nonstop complain a failures because of their own choices, not failures because of the culture. And the people I admire the most are the people who succeeded in this culture. So they found a way. They fought it. They went out and chose and, and, and found a field where they could push forward for themselves, not for me, not for anybody else, for themselves because they value their own life. And you know what? There's a lot of negative. There's a lot of bad stuff in the world out there. There's a lot of bad stuff in the world out there, and it's so easy to get depressed, and it's so easy to sit back and say, "Oh my God, standard of living is going down, and the government's coming, and this is coming, and I pay huge taxes and all that." I can do that. I can do that, right? Right? I, I pay over fifty percent of my tax of my of the money I make in taxes. You know, a lot of what I do is regulate. I stand in the stupid lines in airport security. There's plenty of stuff there. And airplanes I fly. I fly in a lot of airplanes, and some of them really suck. And I know how much they suck relative to the kind of airplanes they could be. Like I could be flying around in a boom. I don't know if you've seen boom. Boom. Boom is exactly an example. Here's an entrepreneur. And, and somebody remind me of his name. He's an objectivist. Here's an entrepreneur who said, I'm going to take on one of the most regulated, controlled, static, you know, a concentrated industries in the world, which is airlines, right? Uh, airplane building. Two companies make almost all the airplanes in the world. I'm going to take them on. Blake Scholl. Uh, Blake Scholl is the, is the entrepreneur. I'm going to take them on. I am going to design a supersonic airplane. I'm going to get it done. I'm going to make it fly. I'm going to make it happen. I don't care about the Chinese. I don't care about Boeing. I don't care about... I am going to figure it out, and I'm going to solve a great, great 
problem and I'm going to create something beautiful and amazing for me because it's going to be fun. And you know what? There's a high possibility I'm going to fail because the FAA will never allow my plane to fly. But God damn it, I'm going to go out there and try and push and, and, and make the most of the opportunity that I have. That I admire. That is a hero. And I, as I said, I could, and I, I got distracted because <laughs> about boom. But my point is this: you could sit back and you can find a gazillion things wrong in the world. And believe me, I can. I, I come from a culture, a Jewish culture, that is really, really good at this. And I, I you know, I'm constantly on the road. I, I, I meet inefficiency and in government and, and, and lack of productiveness and bad products and, and I know what's possible. So I could, I could easily do that. I could easily say that. I could easily live like that. But I don't. Because what's the point? Yeah, I recognize it. I look at the airplanes and I say, shit, this plane is much slower than it could be. I could be in Europe and half the time, this sucks. I do that for a fraction of a second. But you know what? I'm pretty happy being up there in the air, browsing on the internet because there's Wi-Fi on the airplane. And I'd rather focus on that. I'd rather focus on all the good things in my life. And all the good things that people like Blake Scholes hopefully will create for me, like Steve Jobs has already created for me, like the hundreds, no, the thousands, the tens of thousands of entrepreneurs who are creating better stuff for me every single day in the Valley, in Seattle, in Austin, in Boston, in all the centers of technology out there. That's what I'm focused on. That's what you should be focused on. How to make your life the best life that it can be. Not a moaning and complaining and bitching. How to identify and, and see achievement when it's out there. It's right in front of your face. There's wonderful things right in front of your face. Embrace them. Enjoy them. I was just driving the other night. I, came, I, came, I flew into Los Angeles and I, I gave a talk. And so I, was driving, uh, I was driving with Don Watkins home. Um, late at night and we, we were driving by the, uh, the skyline of, of uh, Los Angeles. And I just noticed from a particular angle, one of the buildings on the skyline, and it's gorgeous. And it, particularly at night, the way they've structured the lights on the building, it's, it's just stunningly pretty and innovative and inspiring. And I'd much rather focus on that than on, I, I, could, I could give a five hour talk on how Government has crushed innovation and architecture and government has crushed city development and all the highways suck and there's traffic everywhere. Stop it. What's the point? Right? What's the point? Um, it, it, it is, it is uh, you know, I have an iWatch. I can track, I can track all the stuff that I do during the day. I mean, this thing, my iPhone is, is this amazing amazing technology and I've, and I've got this uh, video camera that it, I just press a button and it looks to it links into Facebook live without any effort and here we are on Facebook live with thousands of people going to watch this show and how cool is all this how cool is the mind that creates all this I don't know how you create a camera like this I don't even have the faintest idea of, and I'm an engineer and I have no clue. I have such admiration and respect for people who can who, who created integrated circuits on a silicon chip. I, I was a dumb civil engineer. I get how you build a bridge. How do you do these tiny little things? How do you get them to behave? I, and I understand how computers work. I understand zero one. I actually programmed in, uh, I, I used to do a lot of programming, but I, I program in assembler. In assembler, actually, I remember I was the last class in my school that did punch cards. So I, I get computers a little bit. And yet, I don't get them at all. I don't get them at all. I don't know how my computer's doing what it's doing at the speed that it does at all. Humans, to quote somebody on the chat, to quote Penny on the chat, humans are amazing. And these humans, these humans... 
that you want to bitch and complain about their political positions are amazing. Amazing human beings. So the solution is not to bitch and complain. The solution is how do we convince them their political positions are wrong? How do we convince them to come to our side? That's what we should spend our energy on. That's what we should be thinking of. These are good guys and gals. How do we turn these people into people whose politics is consistent with their moral values, with their essential moral values at work? How do we convince them that the moral values that they exemplify at work should be their moral values at home? How do we convince them that objectivism is a philosophy for living the kind of life they exemplify at work? That's what we should be spending our time on. Right? I, I, I'd much rather spend my time on trying to figure that one out than talking about Donald Trump. Who cares? The world, or let me put it this way, if we cannot convince these giants, if we not cannot convince these heroes, if we not cannot convince the people who design and make the amazing technology that has been integrated into every aspect of our life, if we can't convince them of the truth of objectivism, what the hell are we doing? Who else is there? That's the, the, the Silicon Valley is the barometer. And I actually I actually take the fact that Silicon Valley is responding to Donald Trump the way they are as a sign of their virtue. Because you know what I think about Donald Trump. But it's more than that. One of the reasons, and I talk about this in a show I did way back. One of the reasons Silicon Valley is so leftist and anti-Republican is because Silicon Valley, to its virtue, will not support candidates who don't believe in evolution. I think that's a good thing. These are secular, pro-science people. They're not going to vote for crazy religious nuts to govern. <laughs> to govern. So... They are pro-science. Being pro-science has nothing to do with being leftist or rightist. They're pro-science as a first and foremost. All right. Um, and they're pro-science because they live science. They live science every day. They live science every day in a way that you guys don't live, in the way that we all don't have an appreciation for. Science is not about politics. Science is science. Science is about what, 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 what these guys are doing all the time. And, 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 you know, I didn't even get into the whole, the whole history of Silicon Valley, which is just fascinating, you know, and, and, and you know, how it all kind of mushroomed out of one company that, that uh, you know, out of Shockley Semiconductors that then spun it, the, that people left and created Fairchild, and then Fairchild spun off and created Intel and eight and uh, advanced micro devices and the whole VC world was created out, out of Fairchild semiconductors. And it, it, you know, just, just the integrated nature and the beauty of this whole thing is just so, I mean, the, the history of Silicon Valley is so amazing and, and how it all really centers around Stanford, HP, Hewlett Packard, which, um, uh, which is, uh, uh, you know, which is really the first real uh, Silicon Valley company is I, I love it. I, I love people on you know on the chat, uh, you know, with great grandiose statements like you. Well, Brooke doesn't know what science is. Um, good for you guys. Um, let me say one other thing. I want to say one other thing about because this links us back to the politics. Silicon Valley exemplifies the idea the the idea of diversity in a positive sense. And Silicon Valley is about justice. Silicon Valley is about, about talent. It's about ability. So in Silicon Valley, you're not evaluated based on where you come from. You're not evaluated based on um, your, uh, your color of your skin. You're not evaluated based on your ethnic background. You're evaluated based on how good you are. 
And as a consequence, Silicon Valley has been this become this amazingly diverse place. Not diverse for the sake of diversity, but diverse because the best, smartest, most capable people in the world go there. And many of them happen to be Indians. Many of them happen to be Chinese. Many of them happen to be Israelis. Many of them happen to be Scandinavians. Some of them happen to be Americans. More than half of the U.S. unicorns, you know, these, these major startups that are valued at $1 billion or more, have at least one immigrant as a founder. Silicon Valley is the land of immigrants. The CEO of Microsoft and the CEO of Google are both in, from Indian uh, origins. I remember in the 90s, half the startups I saw when I was evaluating startups, because I did a little bit of venture capital in those days, were Indians and Israelis. I mean, it's, it's, this is what diversity, if there is a positive meaning to the word, this is what it really looks like. It's getting the best, the most talented from everywhere in the world. And by the way, this is what many within the Trump administration want to crush. And, and, and this connects me, although I'll talk about this more on the AM560 show, to the comment Bannon made, uh, a negative comment that he made about uh, about the fact that uh, two-thirds or three-quarters of CEO in Silicon Valley are from South Asia or from Asia. And then he, 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 he stopped himself and then he says, a country is more than an economy or a civic society, suggesting that having Asians and South Asians detracts from our ability to be a civic society. That's, that's an exact quote from Bannon. And, and I'll, I'll talk about, I'm going to talk about the context in my next show. By the way, you got the numbers wrong which doesn't really matter to me, but 27% of professionals working in Silicon Valley companies are Asian or Asian American. Uh, they represent 19% of managers and under 14% of executives. But, you know, who cares? If it's two-thirds or three-quarters, that's fine as well. Um, so, you know, this is, my, uh, this is my takeaway. Stop obsessing about the negative. Stop using the negative as an excuse for your own lack of success. Stop using the negative as an excuse for not pursuing your dreams, for not making the most of your life. Stop using the negative for not living, for not living. Use Silicon Valley as a model, as a model of people who take their life seriously, model of people who think independently, who are rational, who have self-esteem, who are willing to engage and find new ideas in spite of opposition, in spite of difficulties, in spite of barriers, engage in win-win transactions with anybody who they think has talent and ability and who can contribute something. These are long-term thinkers. These are people to be admired. These are stories to be learned from, to be examined. You know, be optimistic. Optimistic, not in a sense of delusional, not in a sense of non-objectivity, but in a sense of confidence in your own ability and in a sense of an appreciation, an appreciation for the grandeur and beauty of life and the world around you and the achievements of human beings around you, the achievements that are happening every single day. That's the kind of optimism I think every objectivist should have. Wow, it's amazing out there. Look at what the human race has achieved. Look how good life is. Yeah, it could be better, and I'm going to fight to make it better. And I know how to make it better. And I'm going to go out there and teach people how to make it better. I'm going to educate them. I'm going to educate them. Because you know what? They're human beings. Human beings who create these amazing things. These apps on the iPhone, the iPhone, this camera, my computer. Those are human beings that are, that are worth fighting for. That are worth trying to educate. This is not a world filled with irrational brutes. Which is, if you follow the Donald Trump campaign, you, you, you might think. It's not. It's a world filled with creative, amazing people who are mistaken. And we need to help them see the light. 
We need to help them see the truth. And we're not going to help anybody, primarily not going to be able to help ourselves, if we can't see the lights and see the truth. If we are so mired in, in, in depression and hatred and delusion, delusion of self-grandeur, we're so much better than the world, the world doesn't... You know, imagine if Ayn Rand had said, after 12 publishers had rejected Atlas Shrugged, ah, I'm so much better than this world. I'm so much better than these people. What's the point, right? I'm, I'm just going to continue my life. Compl she never complained, really. She fought. She fought. And, and she fought in a positive way. She celebrated achievement. She celebrated businessmen, even in a world where businessmen don't celebrate themselves. All right, I'm going to recommend a couple of, I'm, I'm going to recommend kind of uh, uh, just for fun. And I'm, I'm going to recommend this TV show. And unfortunately, I'm not going to take any more phone calls. So, so you can call in next time. I'm, I apologize. Um, I, I'll, I'll make sure that next time we'll have some time to take your calls on this issue. And then, uh, I, you know, we'll, so sorry, but I've only got five minutes. Um, I'm going to recommend this TV show but only to people who admire Silicon Valley. This is not, your cynics don't watch this, please. Right. And that's Silicon Valley on HBO, the comedy. Because I, I think it's hysterical. I think it's very funny. Uh, and I think it, 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 it makes fun of aspects of Silicon Valley that are worthy of making fun of. Um, and it makes fun but it doesn't, I don't think it makes fun of, of the core of Silicon Valley. I don't think it makes fun of their reason, their productiveness, their hard work, and, and their self-esteem. But it, it makes fun of, of certain characters in Silicon Valley, certain aspects of Silicon Valley. And I thought season one and season two were hysterical. So um, I'm relieved to know that Liwan and I, and I don't just disagree on the concretes of reality. And we don't just disagree on how you abstract those concretes into, into principles, but we also have fundamental disagreements about aesthetics and humor, which is great. Um, it's, a, it's a terrific show that it has kind of a making fun of and love a relationship with its characters. And, and I enjoyed it a lot. And I think I enjoyed it a lot because I lived in Silicon Valley and I know people like this. And I know a lot of people in Silicon Valley. And I know what it takes to start a company. And I know how they work at it. And I know... Anyway... Those of you who love technology, those of you who love Silicon Valley so that you can have the right perspective on the show, I found it very funny and I really, uh, I really enjoyed it. I want to also recommend a movie. Um, and uh, I think I might have recommended this before, but I want to recommend the movie Tucker. Uh, Tucker. And Tucker is a movie uh, based on a true story. Um, and it's, it's made by Francis Ford Coppola and, uh, it, it, you know, actually, I should have looked this up in advance in terms of who the actors are, but um, it's, uh, it's based on a true story about Tucker who built an automobile uh, that was uh, way ahead of its time in, uh, in the 1950s and ultimately was destroyed by cronyism. Um, and... Uh, you know, according to the movie, and, and the question of whether this is right or wrong, uh, historically, I don't know. I'm not taking a position. But the movie shows a passionate, engaged dreamer, a dreamer who then goes out into the world and, you know, creates it and builds it. And is never crushed in spite of the opposition. And is never, is never pulled down because of the opposition. And, you know, it's called it's it's called Tucker the Man and His Dream. Uh, Jeff Bridges is the is the uh, main character. I think he does a, a good job. It has a, a fictional cameo by Howard Hughes. Howard Hughes is portrayed as a good guy, uh, which I think before he went crazy. Uh, I think, he, I mean, he really did go crazy. I think he was a good guy. And I think maybe one of the reasons Howard Hughes went crazy was because of the kind of opposition he got. Um, but uh, I really enjoyed, 
I'd really enjoy Taka, partially because of the sense of life it projected, that go get it, um, or, you know, hold that tiger is kind of the, 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 the song you always repeat, because the tiger just charges, and Tucker just charges. But he's smart, and it shows the struggles, the difficulties, the, the difficulties of entrepreneurs, real difficulties, right? What it takes. So, uh, so I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a big fan. All right, well, thanks, everybody. I hope you enjoyed the show today. We covered, uh, covered quite a bit. If you're interested in my views on Donald Trump's appointees so far, I will cover those in about an hour on AM560 uh, Chicago. You can find uh, the station online. I'll also try to stream it on, um, on Facebook Live, although there they are long commercials, so you have to tolerate long periods of silence uh, during, uh, during the live stream. Uh, and I will talk to all of you uh, next week. Uh, and uh, hopefully I provided a little bit of inspiration. Just a Oh, happy Thanksgiving. By the way, one of the reasons I did, I forgot to say this. One of the reasons I did the Silicon Valley show today is because this week is the week in which we celebrate producers. We celebrate creators. We celebrate builders. We celebrate the most productive people in our world and I'm going to celebrate Silicon Valley this week at a Thanksgiving dinner. So I hope you have all of you, whether you live in the United States or not, have a great Thanksgiving. Don't forget to celebrate production. I'll talk to you next week. How do you turn this off?